Well, hi, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Hallelujah. Here being London, England at the moment, uh, in the Lewisham borough of London, England. As we're here, I'm preaching and teaching for a month. We're one week into that month, and we're, we're doing this video from the room where we're staying in a home that's been open to us uh, for that time that we're here, and that's a real blessing that we get that kind of grace from Amen. people Amen. To, to support our ministry. We're continuing on, as I said, in, the, in Paul's letter to the Romans. We're going into the 12th chapter in this, our 30th session of this, wow. of this study. So before we do that, I'm going to ask Alice if she will just ask God's blessing upon our time together here today. Hallelujah. Father, we just praise you. We thank you. Yes, we bless Lord. you. We ask you, Lord, to just work through Alan as he brings forth your word, that it will reach and touch hearts and change lives, Lord, which only your word can do. And Lord, we again just, we can't say enough how much we love you and, yes, and thank you. You are just the awesome God, the only, only awesome God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 1. By the way, let me, before we do, I, I do want to remind you that uh, all of the studies, the, the previous 29 parts and all of the ones that to come, will be on BibleTalk.com and stay there uh, for as, as long as the Lord allows us to keep that website up. So you can go back and review any sessions, any, any parts of this study that you missed are there and available for you. If you want to invite others to go see them, they're there. And my plan is, because I'm making notes as I go along, uh, at the end of the study, I'll make those notes on the entire letter to the Romans available to anybody that wants them. And just if, if that is the case, you'll write to us at office at BibleTalk.com and just request them and, and they'll be there. The other thing is we just would love to hear you, hear from you. Any comments you have, any questions you have, any suggestions you have, so, so feel free to be in touch with us and create a little dialogue here rather than just have this one way. Hallelujah. Okay? Yes. Okay. Romans 12, 1. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. You know, I, I know we've talked about this in other parts of the letter before. When Paul says, therefore, what he is doing is connecting what he is about to say what to what he said prior. Said, right. But in this case, mm -hmm. when he says therefore, he is connecting it to everything that he has said in this letter so mm -hmm. far. Yes. All right? Because of everything that he's taught, everything that he has brought through the Spirit of God up to this point, he's saying because of that, the result of that should be, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. That's the goal of this letter. Hallelujah. Okay? Mm -hmm. There's so much in this letter. It's, an, it's such an incredible word and a powerful word from the Spirit of God through the Apostle Paul. But Paul is expressing here, you know, this is what it's all about. All right? To get us to this place where we're doing this spiritual service of worship. Remember Jesus said to a woman at the well, the time is coming and now is, that God is seeking those who will worship in spirit and in truth. It's about worship. Then he says, I urge you, right? Now, the Apostle Paul, in all of his letters, you'll find this, it's common. He uses other such words throughout those letters. He says, I beg you, I implore you, beseech, request. Mm. These are the words of Paul's heart, his heart's cry. Yes. to those he loves, to make the sum of what he has written our lifestyle. And this is accomplished through the mercies of God, not through our own power and strength. And, and his plea is not by the way of command. He's not saying, I command you. No. no. Although he probably would have had the authority to do that. Yeah. But God is looking for, and Paul has that in mind of Christ, our free will to do these things. Not by way of command, not by way of compulsion, but that we would want to do this, that this would be our heart to do this. So he's pleading, he's, he's, you know, he's begging, he's imploring, he's beseeching, he's requesting, he's not commanding. 
you've got to do this on your own. You know, God's not going to come and bonk you on the head until you do this, or I'll bonk you on the head again. You know, it's got to be the ch your choice. But willing. Because God is a God of choice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy thirty nineteen. I set before you life and death. I set before you the blessing and the curse. Choose life. God always gives us this choice on this planet, but always tells us the right choice right. to make, right? So, he, to sum up all that he's written so far to the church, he pleads with us to have as a result that we would choose, that we would choose to present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God. What, what sacrifice is acceptable to God? Now, religion, and you know how I use that term, I think, if you've been following this at all, religion has said that burnt offerings, tithes and offerings, and things, things such as that, those are the offerings that are acceptable to God. I mean, you can still walk into churches uh, virtually any Sunday and any place that I've ever been, and they're still going to basically tell you these are the, the sacrifices that God is looking for, right? Not necessarily the burnt offerings, but surely, you know, the tithes and offerings, this is what God is expecting from you. The fact of the matter is, those are not the sacrifices that the Lord is seeking. They may be the fruit of the sacrifice that He does seek, a life totally surrendered to Him. When you surrender your life, when you present your life, your life, your entire life, a living, a holy sacrifice, those other things will become the fruit of that life. But, you know, we've talked about this a lot. We did a, a previous study in the Sermon on the Mount, which is, by the way, available here on the site, talking about the fact that the religion was about ritual. Mm -hmm. But God is looking for righteousness that he's imparted to us and relationship with him. Yes. And it's that relationship that bears this fruit of doing things that are pleasing to God because that's what you do when you're in love with somebody, mm -hmm. right? It's not, it's not forced... And, uh, okay, how, how obvious is that in Scripture? Even in the Old Testament, which everybody says, okay, that's under the law. But even then, the Spirit of God was, was putting this on the heart of people. Look at David. David said, O oh Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Psalm 51, verses 15 to 17. That's what God is looking for, right? A broken and contrite heart. A, a heart that surrenders to Him and receives Him fully. Because whatever is left of you in there, well, that takes up room that He can't have. When you do that, that broken and contrite heart, that surrendering your life to Him, that is worship. That's right. That's worship. Mm -hmm. Okay? I think that, I think, and I have taught, you, you may have seen some of these teachings I've done, that worship is one of the single most misunderstood things in the Christian church today. That's right. I really do. And, by the way, it's one of the most important things. So that's a little scary when you, if you, if you buy into this and say, okay, Worship is the most one of the, the most important thing. That's a goal that God, and yet it's the most misunderstood thing, yes. because we seem to think that you know you come into a building, and a couple of guys get on a keyboard and a, an electric guitar and start banging away, and that's worship. Hardly, hardly. Listen, and there's nothing wrong with songs of praise, with hymns, with with thanksgiving, with encouraging one another, with spiritual songs. Nothing wrong, but that is not worship. We're not to get, what we are supposed to do is to do songs of praise. Right, absolutely. There are no songs of worship. No. Worship is not, let me, let me just talk about that a little more, right? Yeah. The uh, King James, the authorized version, uses the term reasonable service here, okay? Mm -hmm. in, in the Greek, it, the worship is implied, and that's why virtually all of the, the, the newer translations add, put that word in because it's, you know, it, the thing was, 400 years ago, they understood worship, they understood worship better. Yes. Okay, so when they said reasonable service, this, 
this verse that was understood by people. It's not understood today because we think that worship is something else. We think that worship is it's singing. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's not the jumping up and down. It's the slow song. When you get to the slow song, that's worship. Okay, no. The church today has become convinced that singing a few songs, often just entertaining the congregation, mm. defines what worship is. You know, I, I was preaching in London, England here just the day before I was kind of praying for this. And, and at one point, the, the quote-unquote worship leader, okay, said, okay, let's everybody stand up and worship the Lord. Now, you talk about an oxymoron, mm. okay, stand up. After Ezra, you know Ezra the priest and Nehemiah and Ezra, right? After Ezra had read the word of God to the people who were attentive to the book of the law, it says in, in Ezra 8.3, it says, Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Nehemiah 8.6 the Word of God, not music, the Word of God led them to worship, bowing on their faces before God. Revelation 4, 9 through 11. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, to Him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before Him who sits on the throne and will worship Him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, not singing, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. Over and over and over, worship in the Bible is connected to falling down. Because that's what it is. It is just falling before God, totally submitted to Him. All right? Totally humble before him. Oftentimes, on one's face. It's in Genesis. I, again, I'll get you the notes. Genesis 24, 26. Genesis 24, 48. Genesis 47, 31. Exodus 4, 31. Exodus 12, 27. Exodus 34, 8. Second Chronicles 7, 3. First Corinthians 14, 2, And on and on and on. That when people, it's when they use the word worship, it's about falling down. They understood back then. They understood that's what worship was. 400 years ago, they understood what worship was. Mm -hmm. Today, it seems like we don't have a clue. I wanted to say something. You said that after Ezra read the word. Yes. Today, in the, how much is from the pulpit is they'll read a verse and the rest of the hour or so is commentary just on that verse. Well, yeah, yeah, you're right. So that made it the power okay. is in the word. Uh, okay, um, you're making a very good point. I, I don't know how far I can get into this here, but right. it was the practice in the day that people would read the word, mm -hmm. and then and then if there was any commentary on it, so to speak, it would it would follow. All right. And the teaching, like they would stand to read the word, and then they would a teacher would sit, sit to, to expand, expand on the on the word. Right. Yes, um, you, know, you know, even the devil understands that worship is about bowing down. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Think about this: when Jesus went out into the wilderness, right, it was tempted after forty days of fasting, right? In Matthew four, uh, it says. Again, the devil took, took him, Jesus, to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He didn't yes. say, if you sing a new song. No, he sang a certain song right. to me. Yeah. He said, if you fall down and worship me. Worship is about that encounter with God where it is the total surrender of yourself, of your of yourself mm -hmm. to Him, humbling yourself as much as it is possible to humble yourself, giving back to Him that thing that is most precious to you. Yes. You know, the first instance in the English Bible of, of the word worship is when Abraham takes Isaac, his son, his only son, 
His son who was the fulfillment of God's promise in his life. His son who was a gift from God. He takes his son Isaac up the mountain to offer him to God. And God said, no, I'll supply the son, right? But that's the first instance of worship. Giving, offering to God. That which is most precious, precious to you. You know, for most of us, what's most precious to us is, is us. That's right. All right. That's right. The elders well, that I read to you in, in the book of Revelation, they take their crowns. Where did they get the crowns? From God. From God. They were a gift from God. And yet they throw them back at him as an offering to him. The only things that we have that are precious, the only things that we have are good, came from him. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's not the thing, because he gave us the thing in the first place. Mm -hmm. It is the act of surrender, of saying there's nothing that I would withhold from you, God. There is nothing so precious to me that I will not surrender it and give it to you, Lord. Nothing. 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 We need to come to understand worship. Okay, let's go to the house of worship. Wait a minute. You know where you worship? I'm going to tell you the place where you're supposed to worship. Where you are. Absolutely. Where you are. It may be in your bedroom. It may be in your living room. It may be in a church building. It, it may be, you know what? It, who knows where it can be? It's an act. It's not a place. No. And there, there's no worship leaders except for the Holy Spirit. Because if you do it and it's not the Holy Spirit leading you into that act of submission and you're surrendering, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fiasco, it's a lie, it's a, it's a foolishness. Ah, <sighs> okay. Thank you, Lord. Worship is surrendering totally to the will of the Father. Mm. It is surrendering. Let me just go back and read that verse one more time Then we're starting at, right? So worship is... Presenting your body as a living and holy sacrifice. It is surrendering. Giving yourself totally. Okay. Worship is... I'm being redundant here, but it's, uh, it doesn't hurt me to say it again, and it surely won't hurt you to hear it again. Worship is surrendering totally to the will of the Father. That, of course, is totally an impossibility. If you still think like the world. Okay? So Paul continues in this letter, right? What's next? And says, as I scroll, mm. do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So, you, you know, you have to, in order to do this, you got to stop being like the world because the world can't do this. It is impossible for the world to give themselves totally. You know, as long as we continue to try to bring God down to our level, we'll never be able to worship Him. Of course not. No, that's why God is lifting us up to His level. That's right. And that's why we need to come to the realities of the Word of God. Um, it, the, Paul, Paul wrote and said, you know, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. The calling of God in our lives is an upward calling. We need to understand what the Word of God proclaims about our lives, what God has, has accomplished in our lives, and start to live those things. Over and over and over, I hear people praying. You know, I mean, we're, we're blessed with the opportunity to travel um, to quite a number of places. You know, here on this trip, we're all over the United Kingdom. We're going to Germany. We're going to East Africa. Um, we get to visit and meet with a lot of Christians from a lot of different cultural backgrounds. And, and, we, get, and we get to be able to, to be with them. I mean, we live Spend with time, them. Spend time, yes. Yeah, we don't, we're living with them. Now, yeah, yes. we don't go to a hotel and then go yeah. and just have our meeting. I mean, we're interacting with them. Yes, yeah. So um, what happens is we see their lives as they're actually yes, lived, yeah. not just what takes place in, inside in a building, service, right? In the building. And I, I see Christians all the time praying for things, and I say, gosh, you know, you're asking God to do something he's he's, that He's already done. Mm. And over and over and over, that's the case. Oh, God, give me boldness. Well, that's that. that I, sounds I, nice. I don't want to condemn anybody's prayer, but no. the fact of the matter is, it says He's given us. That's right. It says that the Word of God says that the righteous are as bold that's as a lion. Right. 
it says that God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a power of boldness. So, I mean, that's just an example. But over and over and over, I hear Christians continually praying for God to do something. And he's, he, he's sitting on the throne saying, hmm, aren't they paying attention? Yeah, apparently not. Aren't they? I've already done this. Okay? So, Paul here says, don't be conformed to this world. I want to I want to tell you something. You know, we're to be in the world, but not of it. You, this may sound, unless you think about this, pray about it, meditate on it. Religion mm. is part of the world. That's right. Righteousness is God's plan. Relationship is God's plan. Now, when I say religion, you know, interestingly enough, if you were to walk down the street and ask the first hundred people that you encounter what religion is, I think you'd be astounded by some of the answers. But I doubt that many of them would turn to you and say, well, obviously religion, pure and undefiled religion is, did you visit and take care of the widows and orphans and keep yourself unstained from the world? That wouldn't be the answer, would it? It would be about buildings, it would be about, it would be about everything Clergy. but that. Right. Yeah. So religion, when I use that word, I'm talking about as it's done out there. It's actually part of the world system, not part of God's system. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you've said that religion is relationship with man. Re re religion, well, even there, yes, religion is relationship with man. Widows and orphans. and mm -hmm. Okay. Righteousness is relationship with God. God. Right. Okay. So... But don't be conformed to this world, and don't be conformed to the world's religious system and the traditions of religion that are not part of God. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, it is. When Jesus says over and over, you know, you've heard it said, you've heard the ancients say, you've heard it said, but I say to you. Mm -hmm. You know, you see the Pharisees doing this, but I say to you. We've got to get away from that and come to that place where we are being led by the Spirit of God, who uses the Word of God, that light, that lamp, to guide our paths. Because He promised to lead us in paths of righteousness. But that's what He uses to do it. Yes. Okay? Conform to this world. Simply, as simple as I know how to put it, to be conformed means to be like them. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Shaped. The, the, well, to be, the, yeah. the dictionary says that conform means to act like, to become similar to, or just fit in with the accepted standards out there. It comes from an old Latin word meaning to shape, all right? To shape something, that's often done with pressure, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you you know, the Bible uses the example of a potter, God, yes, right? Yeah. Well, a potter puts pressure on something to make it go up or down, that clay, mm -hmm. right? Peer pressure. I think more Christians are affected by peer pressure than, yes. than they're affected by the Spirit of God, okay? And it is incredible what power peer pressure has because we want to be accepted Amen. you know an interesting study was done many years ago I can remember teaching about this when I was doing a teaching on the book of Revelation back in the very early 1980s and I was looking at just reading about behavioral psychologists and the studies that they had done and one interesting one was that they brought in in a college they got like 10 volunteers to come in uh, you know, they bring in groups of ten at a time, and they would show them a color, uh, like um, put a big color on the wall in front of them, and they would say, okay, we're, we're doing an examination to see the perception of color. And they would ask the first person, you know, what, what color is that? And the first person would say, oh, it's blue. And the second person would say, well, that's blue. And it would go down the line, that's blue, that's blue, that's blue. It was actually green, a very distinct green. And actually, it was not a test of color perception. It was a test of pure pressure. Because the first nine people were kind of in on the gag, so to speak. The tenth person was the actual one who was the experiment was being conducted on. Because it would get to that tenth person, and after hearing nine people consistently say, it's blue, it's blue, it's blue, they would most often get to that tenth person, and he would look at that green and say, oh, yeah, it's blue. Because he didn't want to be different than the crowd. He didn't want to be different. So that peer pressure caused him to say something that he actually knew was not true. And that was that was the typical response to that experiment. Mm. I mean, it's just amazing, absolutely amazing, 
how much we don't want to be different than the other people. But listen, you know it says in Deuteronomy, don't follow a multitude into doing evil. Um, don't follow the crowd. Follow the Lord. Amen. That's all I can say about that. Okay. Believers are surely to have higher standards than the world's accepted standards. And that should be easy for us to see. But unfortunately, it often is not. Right? The only other place that this Greek word that, that conform, right? It's only used twice in the New Testament, here and in Peter's first letter. Okay? Peter says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. That's 1 Peter 1, 14 and 15. In the King James, it says, not fashioning yourselves rather than, rather than saying conformed, right? But it has exactly the same meaning. That translation should hopefully make us think about the fashions and styles, not just clothing, but those fashions and styles of life out there should not have impact on our lifestyles. But rather, as Peter says, the holiness of God should be what directs the style of our lives. Right? And for that to happen, we have to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, you know, there's such a logic and perfection and order to the Word of God, right? Being transformed is not just a few minor adjustments to the old, but rather a complete and total metamorphosis. That's like a caterpillar being changed into a butterfly. That's a metamorphosis, right? It starts one thing and it becomes something entirely different. A new creation. Okay. That's what, that's the, the word, the Greek word, that both Paul and Peter use here in the New Testament. The Greek word is more than metamorpho. Oh, metamorpho. <laughs> that's what we get, our word, the English word, metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. right? So, therefore, Paul writes to the Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. Being born again is not God takes the old you, kind of dusts you off and puts you back on the street. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away. This is why I hate to hear Christians talking about, oh, that's the way I've always been. I don't care how you always was. Doesn't matter. Because that's not you. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. You need to live and walk in that new life, that new creation that you are. That metamorphosis has taken place inside this Oh, yeah. It's like, listen, the day that I got saved, I sat down at my kitchen table. I was having a cup of coffee. I opened the Bible for the first time in my life. And I had an encounter, a radical encounter with Jesus Christ. And I was born again. Hallelujah. Mm. At the end of that, at the end of that, when I was, I mean, I'm born again. Guess what? I was still wearing the same old clothes. That's right. I was, I was still wearing the same clothes as when I sat down at the table. What's that got to do with anything? I'm still wearing the same flesh. That's right. That's what it got to do with it. God changed me on the inside. That's right. I became a new being. I was born again of the, of the, from the Father above, I, a new spirit. Because that's what we are. I was wearing the same we old clothes, spirit. and I was wearing the same old flesh. Mm -hmm. And you want to know something? Almost 40 years later, I'm still wearing the same old flesh. Well... Maybe, Maybe that old flesh is a little old. <laughs> Getting a little more wrinkled. Yeah, it's a little older and more wrinkled, but it's still the same flesh. Yeah. And yet, while my body, <laughs> they, listen, should I give you a close up? Mm. Yet, while my body is deteriorating, mm. and indeed it is, that's the fact. That's, that's life that's on this planet. That's the way planet. of the flesh. Yes, yes, that's the way of the flesh. And yet, I wish you could see my spirit mm. because. From that time, almost 40 years ago, God has been fulfilling His Word in me. Yes, yes. What He began, He is completing. Mm -hmm. He has been bringing me from glory to glory. Hallelujah. I have been being transformed Thank by the Jesus. renewing of my mind. I am not the same thing that I was mm -hmm. all those years ago. Someday you'll see me as I actually am, and I will see you as you actually am. When we all get to heaven, oh, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Hallelujah. When we put up, I'm not going to be wearing the shirt. No. 
I'm not going to be wearing this flesh. Hallelujah. Yeah. Because the imperfect will be put off, and I'm going to be wearing the perfect. Praise God. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's not the old cleaned up. It's brand new. Well, but the new you, when you came out of the tomb like Nat Lazarus, yes. when you were raised from the dead like Lazarus, when you were called to life by name, by Jesus, like Lazarus, you came out of that tomb like Lazarus, wrapped in the garments of death, mm. the grave clothes. Check it out, John eleven forty four. 44, right? So the first thing that Jesus commanded was that he be unbound. We came out of death, the deformity of sin, into new life, reformed, but still wrapped in the old habits, the old traditions, and the ways of the world that we were trained up in mm -hmm. until that day of our new birth. Mm -hmm. So now, what we have to do is we have to put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul said in Ephesians 4.24. How do you transform by renewing your mind? Well, let, let's start with this. Put on the new self. Make it a conscious act to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, as he also says. Yes. All right? To walk by the Spirit. If you're going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and you must be, you know, we are fear, it says in Psalm 139, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, 14. We are. And yet, in his infinite wisdom, God did not put a zipper in the top of our heads so we could just unzip and stick a Bible down and zip back up. No, no, no. No, no, no. We, we have to train. Now, you know, computers, they, they seem great. Trans computers have changed our world. I mean, you know, when I was young, there were no computers. I mean, I can remember in the, around 1970, 71, the early 1970s, um, I'm an early adopter is what we're called, you know, I, I, I like techie stuff. And I went out and I bought one of the first handheld calculators, the digital calculators. I remember that, yes. A little thing, you know, uh, and I think I paid about 350 bucks for it. That's wow. back in 1970 dollars. 350 dollars I paid for this handheld calculator. Uh, you can go out and buy the same thing now for a buck. You can go to any pound store in the UK or any dollar store right, in the US exactly. and walk out with that same calculator for a technology that you right? have, yeah. uh, it, it is incredible. But as, as incredible as those computerized wonders are, they don't can't, can't begin to compare to what God has made us. But like those computers, I'm sitting here now using a computer because I think it's a great tool. I've got so many translations of the Bible on here. I've got oh, so many tools. It's, it's wonderful. But it has input devices. I've got a mouse mm. to put information or to, you know, I have a keyboard to put information. Mm -hmm. there, there are input devices into the CPU, the brain of this computer. God, those are poor imitations of what God designed. Mm. Okay? Sorry. To transform my mind, I've got to use the input devices that he has provided to get the things I need in there. That's right. Okay? God has given me, in his perfect design, he's given me ears to hear his voice. Mm -hmm. He's given me eyes to fix upon Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of my faith. He's given me a nose that I might smell the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon. He's given me a mouth to taste and see that the Lord is good and to eat his word because man doesn't live by bread alone. He's given me the sense of touch that I might, like that woman with the issue of blood, reach out and touch the hem of his garment. That's why we have these senses. That's not the way we were using them before we got saved. The question really becomes, is it the way we're using them now? You know, and it, it, that, that doesn't happen overnight, okay? When, even when you're born again, you've got to change the way you think. You've got to be transformed. So, because they don't change automatically. 
We've been given everything in the Word pertaining to life and godliness. The answer is always in the Word. Yes. Always. Hebrews 5.14. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses, senses trained to discern good and evil. We've got to practice to train our senses. They have to be trained to put aside our common sense. That's what it says in Proverbs 3, 5. Mm -hmm. Lean not on your own understanding. What do you think that is? That's your common sense. And everybody right? has it. Everybody has it. That's why it's called common. Right? That's right. But God says don't use it. Mm -hmm. Lean not on your own understanding. We have to learn to sense the presence of God in all our situations, all the days of our life, so that we can say like David, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. We've got to learn to sense the presence of God using what God has given us. Our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our nose, our sense of touch. If you want to be transformed, you better get this down. I don't know how you think you get transformed by the renewing of your mind. If what I just said to you is not God's answer. Okay? Why do you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind? That you may prove. That's what it says. Okay? Now, when it says prove here, uh, if you go to a modern dictionary, you will find these definitions in there. Although it's not, we don't commonly use this word in a sense, all right? Mm -hmm. To prove something, you prove gold, for example. Right. Okay? Right? It's testing it. It's testing. That's what it means, to examine it, to test it. You'll, you'll never obey the will of God until you have tested it and you're sure that it is of God. Yes. Okay? Amen. Doesn't God say, prove me now? Mm -hmm. Right? You test it. Think of this verse from the Gospel of John. John 7, uh, verses 16 and 17. So Jesus answered and said to them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. You've got to prove it. You've got to test it. You've got to know that it comes from God in order to be able to do his will. A renewed mind is one that, like Jesus, and we have the mind of Christ, yes, we do. Right? is changed and transformed to be like Jesus. Saying, not my will, but yours be done. Luke twenty two forty two. Because at the end of the day, this renewed mind is one that says, not my will, but thy will, Father. That is total surrender to God. That is worship. Yes. Jesus at the cross is the perfect picture of worship. Total surrender to the will of the Father. Amen. We need to get this. We need to understand this. Because we need to worship Him who is worthy of our worship. And you will not do it until you know that it's God's desire for you to present yourself a living and holy sacrifice. Until you know that you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind and think differently than you used to. To think differently than the world did. To think as Jesus does with that mind of Christ. And this is a daily thing that we have to do. I can't, I, I, I just, I'm trying to think of how can I possibly stress this more than I'm, mm. I'm saying. Because you want to know something? You're not going to hear anything more important than what I'm telling you right now today. Right. I, I, I'm not saying that out of the boldness of who I am or what I am. Or, I'm saying that because that's the Word of God. That's right. There's nothing more important in your life than coming into this absolutely right relationship with God. You know, you can say, well, I, got, I, I can't take a time now because i got to get off to work. i got to do Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the rest will be added unto you. That's right. He'll take care of it. He is in control. If he's not, you're in trouble. That's right. That's yeah, right. If he's not, you're in trouble. 
Romans 12, 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each one a measure of faith. Paul speaks with the authority of God, not because of his past credentials. And he had past credentials. As a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, trained up by the famous Gamaliel. His authority comes through God's grace and God's calling in his life. That is far better than speaking because of credentials. Yes. Our Bible schools, our seminaries, are they, are they serve a purpose? Well, I pray that they do. But the fact is, the power comes, the calling has to be from God. Amen. That's what gives you the right to use God's word as Paul did. Yes, the other things there are to equip the saints for the work of service. But you've got to be called by God to the work of service. Amen. The Bible school can't call you to the work of service. Yeah. The seminary can't call you to the work of service. The church can't call you to the work of service. It has to be the calling of God in your life that brings you to that work of service. And then it's not based on, on man's wisdom about God. It is about the Holy Spirit of God within you radiating out. So Paul says, I say to everyone among you, right? For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you. That's an interesting statement. Okay. Um, the reason it's interesting, it's interesting to me, is because I do a lot of teaching on the fact that not everything in the Word of God is written to you. That's right. What? Well, there's a lot of things in the Word of God that you wouldn't want to hear God say to you. No. Um, I There's mentioned the Sermon on the Mount a couple of times. I promise you, you do not want to hear God say to you, depart from me, you evil one, I never knew you. No, no, no. But it's there. That's the Word of God. That's the word of God. And, you know, so that's not, I, I pray that's not to you and I pray that's not to me. So everything that's in the word is not God speaking to you. However, everything in the word of God is God speaking for your instruction. That's what Paul says, right? For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of scriptures we might have hope. Romans, that's here in the letter of Romans, Romans 15, 4. But everyone, without exception, is called to humility. Amen. Okay? There is no exception to that rule. That's why Paul can say, I say to everyone, to the saved. I'm just going to read, and we'll probably wind up ending up around here. In Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to read. Philippians chapter 2, I'll start at verse 5. This is to this, think about this if you are saved. If you're not, get saved because uh, your time is running out. Verse 5 Have this attitude in yourselves, this mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the King of glory humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Worship. The total surrender to the will of God the Father. Not my will, but thy will be done. Even if you're unsaved, if you're unsaved, you know, you can, you can play around here now during this, you know, David said, this life here on this planet is but a vapor. It comes, it goes. But everybody, the saved and the unsaved, so if you're unsaved and you hear these words, think about this. In Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11, so that at the name of Jesus, 
every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Even those people who wind up in hell, they are going to bow before the name of Jesus Christ. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everybody will bow. Everybody will confess that Jesus is Lord. We will all be humbled before him that he might exalt us. His purpose is to exalt us, to bring us up to where he is in fullness. Okay? If you don't receive that free gift, that free gift of salvation now, you're going you're gonna to be humbled. You're going to be confessing his name. You're going to be bowing before his name. You will prostrate yourself before his name. But you're going to be doing it from a place you really don't want to be. And you don't have to go do something today to work to get prepared for this. You don't have to get ready. You don't have to try and put on different clothes and look nice. All you got to do is say, yes, Lord. Because he is, even as he said to a disobedient church, he's standing at the door and knocking, waiting for you to invite him in. Invite him into your heart. And to you who are saved, if you're not living this new lifestyle that goes along with the new life that he gave you, today is a day of decision. You know, God spoke through Joshua out in the wilderness to the people of God. I'm telling you, it was God moving through him. When he said to the people of God, choose you this day whom you will serve. He is a God of choice. This whole thing ends in the valley of decision. It's always about choice. Yes. Choose today to worship God in spirit and in truth, to humble yourself before the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you. Father, we just thank you that it is a free gift, that we don't have to earn it, that we don't have to work for it. All we have to do is receive it because your son Jesus Christ, Father, has done everything needed for our salvation. He has fulfilled your promise that you would be the one who redeems us. And not only that you would be our redeemer, but you would no longer call our sins to mind, that you would cast them as far as the east is from the west, that we would be new creations with a new start, a fresh start, Lord God. So we praise you, we thank you, we bless your holy name. And Father, I pray that you teach us to worship in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, God bless you. May the peace of God be upon you totally until we meet again. And until then, I know that Alice wants to remind you that Jesus loves you a lot. Yes. God bless you. Until next time. Bye-bye.